Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to The 51%, a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, how French mothers are being taught to use their parenting skills to their advantage when they re-enter the workforce. Also, the right to know. We meet Helen Derbyshire, who's leading the campaign for greater transparency in government and not afraid to use a spanner, the Jordanian women who are determined to become plumbers. But we begin here in France, where more than 80% of the country's part-time employees are women, a number of them re-entering the workforce after a significant break. But one French association has been teaching mothers to realise their parenting skills are in fact a bonus when they resume work, and with much success. In their 30s, 40s and 50s, the women in this class have something in common. They all stopped working to raise their children. Now they want to get back in the saddle. Virginie was an executive assistant, but after 14 years dedicated to her family, she sees herself as a primary school teacher. When you don't work, you lose self-confidence, you think you have no value to an employer and that you don't know how to do much compared with all the women who haven't stopped working. With guidance from their teacher, the mothers practice presenting themselves as candidates. Constance has been out of work for 20 years. Now she wants to become a social worker. I want to do something for myself, to move away from being so-and-so's wife or so-and-so's mother. And of course, the cost of living has risen dramatically. My children are at school and university. I have to financially contribute to my family. Here, mothers learn to value the work they've effectively done for years for free. These women have been instrumental in many charities and organizations where they've worked for free. They all have skills. What they've done, they've done as professionals. Armel has learned no longer to blush at the nine-year gap in her CV. A mother of three, she impressed interviewers with her organization and management skills. I had a real complex about having spent several years at home. But I learned to draw out the positives from those years. Armel's been working as an office manager in a consulting firm for the last two years. Her biggest hurdle? Getting back up to speed with technology and a host of new social networks. Now, thanks to politically challenging times, the battle to keep governments accountable is said to become all that more important. One woman leading the campaign here in Europe is Helen Derbyshire, the Executive Director of Access Info Europe, which works to advance government transparency while fighting corruption. She's here in Paris for the Open Government Partnership Summit and joins me now in the studio. Helen, thanks for coming in. Thanks, Annette, for the invitation. Now, we're witnessing very much a political swing to the right, if not the far right, in the developed world. What is set to change for those of you who are campaigning for greater transparency in governments? Well, certainly 2016 has been a year in which we've realised that we cannot take democracy for granted. Um, and for those of us who've been demanding government transparency for many years now, I've been working on this issue for around 20 years, perhaps there is a silver lining in this year that we have the governments now listening to what we're saying and entering into a dialogue about how to make governments more transparent and how also to listen to what people are saying and the concerns of ordinary people. Because we've witnessed the politics of anger in a way, haven't we? Absolutely, absolutely. I think people do feel very disenfranchised. And we've had a series of shocks to the system, whether it be the financial crisis, terrorism, now the pressure that's been put on the system through the influx of refugees, which I believe we can handle, but nevertheless, how precisely to do that is a, a question. And these, uh, these stresses on our democratic system are being exploited by populists to get a message across. And what we really need to do is have a proper debate about how to solve these issues. And as citizens, as member of the, members of the public, we can't have that debate without information, without data. I think many of us, however, here in Europe, take for granted uh, th that our rights are being respected. But is that really the case? 
I think that in Europe we're incredibly lucky to live in societies where, by and large, human rights are respected. But that doesn't mean that everything's perfect. There is no perfect democracy. And what we're seeing is that when we have challenging political decisions to take, um, for example, about how we handle the financial crisis or how we deal with an influx of refugees, it's at that point that we need mechanisms by which the, we can have a proper debate and the public can engage in discussing what's the best way to reach a solution. And I think that what we've seen during the course of 2016 is a concern about a political elite which is taking decisions without proper dialogue with and consultation with the wider public. Is, is that becoming part of a, a wider global trend? We've, we've made huge progress in government transparency in the last few years. Um, we've gone from about 20 freedom of information or access to information laws uh, a couple of decades ago to over 100 now. And we've got the right of access to information, our right as citizens, to know what government is doing, recognised as a fundamental right. But that's something that political elites also have to get used to. They have to get used to being open about what they're doing and engaging and involving citizens in decision making. So why is access to government information so critical for women? So if we think about the kinds of issues which many women may be concerned about, um, it may be things to do with the education system, the health system, to do with employment, um, then the data that we need to understand the way our, what's happening in our societies is often held by government. So let's take an example of, which is a, a big issue in Europe, the differentials in salaries between men and women. There's recently been data released, which enables us to understand quite how widespread and significant that is. Having the information that governments collect and hold about the difference in salaries, which is as much as 17% on average and bigger in some countries, we can actually have a debate. And as women, we can address that issue and advance the case for greater equality. There is an, a common assumption, Helen, that uh, if there were more women involved at all layers of government, that somehow the risk of corruption would significantly decrease. Do you believe that would indeed be the case? I think what's very interesting, if we look at um, the, the data, then clearly we've got more men involved in government, still in the political uh, in political positions. And also, rather interestingly, if we look at the lobbyists who often have a great impact on how decisions are taken, they tend to be dominated by men as well and by people with business interests. Now, if we were able to involve more women in decision making, both through formal posts in government as well as by being consulted as citizens, then we could shift the balance towards decision making which is really in the wider public interest rather than narrow economic uh, or personal interests. And I think that that, in turn, would contribute to reducing corruption because, after all, corruption isn't only money-changing hands. That's one kind of corruption. But also corruption is when decisions are taken which favour certain interest groups, such as economic business interests. And I think what's very important, and it's, this is one of the challenges for our societies going forward, is to ensure that when decisions are taken, they are decisions which will deliver better government and advance society for all different groups in society, including women and various other groups in society. So, yes, I think involving everyone, including women, in particular, in, uh, in decision-making could make a huge difference and reduce corruption. Helen Derbyshire, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Annette. And finally, female plumbers are indeed a rare breed, even far more so in the Arab world, where traditional gender roles confine many women to jobs such as teaching and nursing. But one woman in Jordan is now turning the wrench with the best of them. It can be physically demanding, but working gives Mutlak strength. The 41-year-old Jordanian is a newly qualified plumber, trained by a US government aid agency project and armed with her own toolkit and a business plan. But she's also somewhat of a maverick. Most jobs, especially manual ones, are the preserve of men in Jordan, and Mutlak sees herself as a role model for an alternative society. 
بشجع كل النساء انها تمشي باي مهنه مهما كانت I encourage all women to practice any profession as long as it is in line with religion and morals بنكسر الحاجز We will break down the barriers that have been put up that say we aren't capable of doing things as women. There is also a barrier of fear within us that has to be broken. But Mutlak's vision isn't widely shared in Jordan, where only 14% of women work outside the home, one of the lowest female workforce participations in the world. And in Mutlak's conservative neighborhood, many reject her choice. This job is suitable for men, not for women, especially in our conservative community. It's different to Western communities. Thanks to God, the women here have their identities and jobs that suit them and which don't violate social norms. Since graduating, Mutlak has struggled to find work. Some customers prefer her male colleagues. But with the economy suffering in the wake of new waves of refugees, the country may have to turn to women like Mutlak to stay afloat. The UN estimates Jordan's economy would grow by 5% if jobs were more equally distributed between women and men. And that's it for now. And if you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, you can head to our Facebook page. That, of course, being France 24, full stop 51%. Or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. Thanks for your feedback so far. And please do keep those comments coming in. So until our next show, bye for now.